What's going on everyone? So in today's video, I'm going to be going over what is the best camera for a safari. So let's get into it. Right, so I just want to start out by saying that I do know there are many, many different types of safaris that you can go on. So I'm going to be focusing on a typical South African safari. So this is a safari industry that I worked in for five years. And this is going to be quite similar to places like Zimbabwe and Botswana as well, for an example. And this is not quite going to cover the extremes in terms of the thick jungles of Rwanda, for example, or the very expansive grasslands of East Africa. If you are planning on going there or you are interested in sort of what cameras might be best for those circumstances, please just drop a comment below or reach out to me on any one of my social medias that are also tagged in the description and I'll gladly assist. So I want to split the types of cameras up into five categories. So these are five categories I saw people bringing on Safari for my time working as a guide. And these five categories are number one, a smartphone, Number two, an action camera. Number three, a bridge camera. Number four is a DSLR or mirrorless entry to mid-level camera. And number five would be your pro or semi-pro to pro level DSLR or mirrorless. So I'm gonna be going over the pros and cons of each one of these types of cameras and maybe give suggestions as to who they would benefit or why you should or shouldn't maybe take them on a safari. And then stick around to the end where I'll be telling you the camera setup that I use for my time in the bush. So the first category is phones and smartphones. And why I think this is really great is the majority of people already have one. So you don't need to go out and purchase something else. You have it with you. It's really small. It's really light. It fits in your pocket. So it's great to travel with. On top of being easy to transport and everything like that, when it comes to actually using it as a camera or to take videos as well, it is really good in the fact that it's really easy to use. So you can just pick it up and pretty much snap it and the technology and the systems in the phone basically help you to take better photos. You can also do some other adjustments like picking your focus point, changing your exposure and even locking onto a subject to lock that exposure before snapping your picture. Videos are really great as well. A lot of phones have built in HDR, so that's high dynamic range that basically protects your highlights and shadows, actually often quite better than other cameras like this that you would have to fix in post-processing. So video capabilities are really good, but some of the negatives are just the image quality at a bit of a distance. So when you are on your wide camera, that's the default camera, it is really, really good. But if you are trying to zoom in, that's when you start to lose a lot of detail and quality. I know there are some phones that have built in three or two or five or 10 times lenses in them. They're a lot better at these zoom ranges, but when you are dealing with birds or animals that are further away from the vehicles, that's when it starts getting really tricky and you get that quality that you're looking for. Another benefit with your smartphone as a camera on Safari is the fact that once you've got that shot or that video, you can upload it straight to social media or send it to your friends and family that day. It's really nice for that and just being on the move. Category number two is the action cam. So these are most notably things like GoPro or your DJI Osmo or a lot of other brands as well. And what they are really made for is action sports and videography. So not so much on the photo side of things, although their technology within the newer models have definitely improved with that. Like I said, they are great with video. So it is kind of a fun experience to play around with. You know, they're really small. You are able to, for example, stick them on the sides of the vehicles or on the bonnets of the vehicles when you're on a safari and get a different point of view, as well as being able to extend it on a selfie stick or something like that. You can also use the chest harnesses or on a cap as well. And that kind of gives you a first person view and it kind of shows an experience of what you are seeing. So if you are wanting to get those sorts of shots, then this might be a good camera for you. A big negative with the action cams is the fact that it's just such a wide field of view. So it is great, like I said, to show your field of view and what you can see, but unless animals or birds are right next to the vehicle, you almost struggle to see them. And on the positive side, when I mentioned that, you know, you can stick them on sides of vehicles, you can put them on the bonnets, you also find that 
you, you've seen amazing videos of people who have left GoPros on the floor and had something like a lion walk past it and that's great and it provides an amazing shot but you don't always have the opportunities especially if you're on a safari and you're in a vehicle and there's other guests there and you know depending on where you are and the guide you have and the lodge you're visiting you just might not have those opportunities so it's a bit of risk involved with that camera type number three is the bridge camera so i've noticed compact cameras people almost never bring on safari but a bridge camera is the gap or the bridge between your compact camera and your big dslr camera and they are really good in the fact that they generally are quite compact quite small and light but they offer quite a big zoom so they all have one lens attached to them and you cannot interchange lenses so you can't change from a wide angle lens to a super telephoto but they have it all in one so this definitely is a one big positive you've got this one camera that can do almost anything a lot of them start as wide as 24 millimeters for example and they can push as far as 600 or even further 1200 in some cases so it gives you that ability to just use the one camera to do almost everything so these cameras can also be quite good for beginners that are getting used to cameras because it, like your smartphone it can be used as almost a point and shoot but there are options to play around with things like aperture and shutter speed and get to know your camera one thing i've noticed a lot with people who bring bridge cameras on safari is the stabilization when they're at these long ranges i know this is improving dramatically with the newer models but what you'll find is when you zoom in so far the slightest move you have in your camera will make a huge move in the final image whether it is video or photos so I do suggest something like a monopod, a tripod or a beanbag just so you can help stabilize that shot a little bit better. So bridge cameras were once thought just to be kind of an entry level beginner system but they're actually becoming a lot more advanced in their features at the moment. But like a DSLR, the more you want, the more you're going to pay. So to get the really high end bridge cameras, you're actually going to be paying quite a lot of money at the moment. So moving on to your entry level or mid level DSLR to mirrorless system so what i mean by this is simply a kit that someone goes and purchases from a shop generally come with a body like i said entry to mid-range body and they'll come with a variety of kit lenses so some of the more common lens combinations that your kits will come with is your smaller 18 to 55 millimeter lens something like a 55 to 200 this is for example an 18 to 200 and then more commonly also is your 70 to 300. So these cameras are great for people getting into cameras and trying to learn more because like your phones and your bridges, you can do a lot just with the auto systems of the camera. You then can start playing with your settings and dialing around to get to know more and use more of the features. What is nice with most DSLR and mirrorless is now is a lot of them do have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built into them which means when you do snap those pictures, you can transfer them to your phone and upload them and send them to your friends. So what differs this to a bridge camera is the way that you are able to basically take lenses off and change lenses. So this is really great because you will get higher quality pieces of glass in a lot of these lenses and you are then able to basically upgrade lenses without having to change your camera. So then you can upgrade to something like this and put it on and you can use different lenses at a slightly higher quality for different circumstances but this also comes as a negative to some people some people might prefer the bridge system we spoke about just now just because it's ease of use and you can use the same lens for a variety of shots so the last category i want to talk about today is your semi-professional to professional cameras in both the dslr and your mirrorless systems so these are generally targeted at people who know their way around a camera because specifically if you're looking at your professional bodies and professional cameras a lot of them no longer have auto systems so you will have to use a semi-manual or full manual mode so to get the most out of it you're going to need to know your way around a camera so i definitely don't recommend someone going out and buying a high-end expensive camera if you do not know how to get the most out of it that might be easier for you to go and get a more entry-level DSLR that would help you in your beginning stages and maybe invest more in a higher quality lens. So just some negatives with these cameras is they are expensive and they are big and heavy, especially with the bodies and also when you go into higher focal length ranges. So I mentioned earlier a 200 lens, here is a 200 kit lens 
but this one next to me is also a 200. So this is just a higher quality with a much larger aperture and that's why the lens needs to be much bigger. So definitely one of the big pros between these higher end cameras is the features in the body itself. So what it's able to shoot, it's things like high frame rate, very high image quality, high formats of video, things like 4K, and just a good image stabilization for an example. And you also find your focusing systems are a lot faster in your semi-professional to professional ranges. And especially when you are photographing wildlife, wildlife is similar to how you would photograph sport, for example. There can be lots of fast movement. Yes, sometimes the animals are dead still and there's no problem, but if you do have flying birds or running animals, you do need to be able to focus and lock onto that subject quickly before getting that shot. So when it comes to the end as to what should you get for your safari. So this is going to depend on what you want to do with your photos. Why are you taking photos on a safari? Are you just taking photos just to show your friends and family? Because then something like a phone might be perfect. You're not worried about having to print your photos at home or anything like that. And you just want to share the memories and enjoy your time on a safari and not carry things with you. Then a phone might be the way to go. When it comes to the action cam, I wouldn't generally recommend people to go and buy an action cam for a safari. Unless they are thinking about putting all these creative shots together and building kind of a memory or a film that they can show their friends on their experience. But if you do already own one, it might be good to bring it along just because it's so small and you can just fit it in your bag or in your pocket. So the bridge camera systems are really great for people getting into photography and people who don't want to carry around two or three different lenses. And this would be for your more entry level bridge camera. Because like I said, they can do quite a lot with very little. And potentially when you're looking at your higher end bridge cameras, this might be really great for someone who's actually fed up with all of these heavy lenses and these multiple lenses they're having to change. Some of your top brands that are bringing out these new bridge cameras are exceptional. They're actually really, really good. They are pricey, but they can substitute your bigger cameras like this for someone if you are wanting them. With those bridge cameras, you will be able to blow up your photos to print them to certain sizes and make photo books for an example. So when it comes to these DSLR kit cameras or the entry level mirrorless systems, these would be for people who are maybe wanting to get into photography a little bit more and for people who just want a bit more reach and quality over a phone to get those nice shots that they can then go home and print on their walls or put them in photo books and share them on social media. One thing I do want to add that I have seen people make the mistake before on Safari is if you are bringing one of these DSLR cameras, I would recommend at least a 200mm lens, if not more. Just because I've seen people come with the kit lenses of an 18 to 55 for example, and just really struggle because 55mm is not very far in a zoom at all. So I would recommend at least a 200 if not a 300 And there are other lenses you can buy to fit these cameras that aren't that expensive. For an example, Nikon have an 80 to 400. There's some third party lenses as well like Sigma and Tamron that aren't going to break the bank as much as you might think. So they are definitely something to look into. But like I said, I would suggest a minimum of 200 or 300 just for those shots of the animals. So when it comes to your semi-professional to professional systems with the mirrorless and DSLR cameras, I would say this is for someone who definitely knows their way around a camera. It's not something I would recommend a first time photographer buying. Definitely know your way around the camera and be able to use as much of the functionality you can. And also for people who are wanting to print images, make photo books and get that really high quality look. So when I started in the bush, I was using a Sony A100 with a Sigma 50 to 500 lens as my main lens. And that was great. The quality wasn't fantastic. And it was the perfect setup for me to learn my way around a camera and learn in photography and teach myself. I then upgraded to a Nikon D7000 body and I had this 80 to 400 lens, which is also fantastic. So great zoom as well, nice variety of what you could get. And then as I progressed and taught myself more and more and needed more functions and learned more about photography, I upgraded to a Nikon D500, which I'm currently filming on. And my main lens is this one here, which is a Nikon 70 to 200 f 2.8. And I just love the combination. 
The D500 was made by Nikon as a sport camera and combined with an ultra fast f2.8 lens it is just a beast of a combination. It's so fast, it's nice, it's not too heavy to hold and I'm able to move it around and get very quick shots as well as being able to manipulate settings in a way that I like and take the photos I like. So I hope you all enjoyed that and I hope you all learned something and if you do have any questions on anything I've mentioned or anything you want to add please pop it in the comments below. If you liked the video I would appreciate a thumbs up and a subscribe to the channel would be amazing. So I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next video.